Uh, my name is Gary Moore, and five years ago tonight, a show called I've Got a Secret was born. On uh, June 19th, 1952, I've Got a Secret went on the air as a summer replacement for Casey, crime photographer. And we've been on the air ever since. We've received dozens of awards, hundreds of brickbats, and millions of letters from all of you. Of course, um, when actors celebrate an occasion like this, they always make a big fuss about the talented people behind the scene. That's exactly what we're going to do tonight. Exactly what we're going to do. <laughs> Only instead of just talking about these people, we're going to let you meet them. Seems hard to believe, I know, but it takes 73 people to put I've Got a Secret on the air every week. I got to working on research, and we tried to add up the amount of experience they have had in total. We found out that those 73 persons have been in show business a total of 1,327 years. Panel, on behalf of those 73 people, shall we make a wish? All right, here we go. Now then. <laughs> this is a rehearsal light, and this is what our stage looks like before the show comes out of the air to you. Now, if you'd like to know what stage hands do, we're going to show you right now. Lights. Camera. Action. This is our stage group. Jerry Callender and his men from the prop department. Ed Gasberti and his men from the carpentry department. Overall lighting by Max Greenfield and his department. They have been at work now about 10 seconds in putting up this whole set that you're used to seeing every week on the street. <laughs> New record tonight, fellas, 17 seconds. And now we're all set to play I've Got a Secret. Got a Secret, starring Gary Moore. Thank you. Seated to my left is a very close friend of mine. He is well known to all of our panel and all of us here, but I will ask him to identify himself to you. Will you tell the audience what your name is? Eddie Mendelson. Eddie Mendelson. And Eddie, what is your job? I'm the studio supervisor of this studio. Uh, how long have you been in show business, Eddie? 34 years. 34 years. All right, Eddie Mendelson has a secret. He's going to whisper it to me. At the same time, we'll show it to you folks there at home. Here we go, Eddie. <laughs> now, panel, we're going to give you one question each, and this concerns something that Eddie did, and we'll start with Bill Cullen. Eddie, this thing that you did, was it in show business? Yes. Buzz, one question. <laughs> Jane? Did you do it in this theater, Eddie? No. No. Buzz! Did it concern a, a name in show business? Yes. All That's right, I'll tell question. you this. I'll give you, because one question. I'll give you the name was Bing Crosby. Buzz, and we go to, we go to Faye for one last question. Did you, um, uh, did you uh, dis uh, discover Bing or know Bing when he was very young? No. No, you have lost the full $80 because Eddie once auditioned Bing Crosby and fired him, told him he couldn't sing. Oh! <laughs> That was back in 1924 when Eddie was stage manager of the Music Box Review for Sam Harris and Irving Berlin, and Bing Crosby auditioned for the show. What was wrong with Bing singing, Eddie? Well, he couldn't be heard past the third row. His voice just wasn't strong enough. Of course, in those days, he didn't have microphones in the theater. All right, so you had to fire Bing Crosby. Now, in 1935, Eddie Mendelson produced his own Broadway show called Squaring the Circle. And who was uh, uh, signed on to star in that show? Uh, Humphrey Bogart. Humphrey Bogart. What was his salary? $125 a week. $125 a week. Didn't something happen during rehearsals, Eddie? Yes, he and the director could not get along together. So, in 1935, poor Eddie had to fire Humphrey Bogart. But the show ran more than six months on Broadway. Now, in 1940, Eddie was the stage manager of a show called Hold On To Your Hats, starring Al Jolson and Martha Ray. And there was a young fellow signed to play the juvenile lead that gave you a problem, I believe, wasn't it? Yes, he kept chewing gum while he was reading his lines. And you had to fire him, too? I had to fire him, too. What was his name, Eddie? Van Johnson. Van Johnson. <laughs> Eddie, 
we want to thank you for being with us. You have your $80, your carton of Winston, your office is lined with them. Don't fire any of us until the show is over. <laughs> thank you. Now, next, I want you to meet another of our backstage workers, and his name is Harvey Vincent. And Harvey is one of our ushers. Now, the job of usher has been a highway to fame ever since broadcasting began. A small list of people who used to be ushers would include um, Dave Garraway, Gordon McRae, Gene Rayburn, Don Murray. All of them were ushers. As a matter of fact, Henry Morgan was an usher at uh, WMCA here in New York City. And next week, Faye Emerson's son, Scoop, will begin his career in show business as an usher, unfortunately, at another network. Now, Harvey here has been rehearsing all week with a very distinguished lyric soprano, and the two of them are going to sing a duet for you. So now we present that great singing team of Vincent and Meadows. There, I smell blossoms and the trees are bare. All day long I seem to walk on air. I wonder why. I wonder why. I keep tossing in my sleep at night. And what's more, I've lost my appetite. Stars that used to twinkle in the skies are twinkling in my eyes. I wonder why. You don't need analyzing. It is not so surprising that you feel very strange, but nice. Your most pitter patter. I know just what the matter because I. of course, was one of the married relatives of our show, Mr. Stephen Allen. Our next guest, ladies and gentlemen, is also from our backstage crew, as are all our guests tonight, and his name is Lon Masterson, who operates the lighting board. Lon has been in the electrician's department at CBS for three years, but he is also a professional hypnotist and illusionist. And he, too, has rehearsed with tonight with another great prestidigitator. So now we present those masters of illusion... <laughs> Masterson and Cullen. Well, I think you're going to need a cane for this bit. I'm going to need it to hit him with for turning those eyes <laughs> upside down. Actually, thank you very much, Lon, for the cane, but uh, why don't you get one? You go. I got mine right here. Oh, you're going to be a sneaky one to work with tonight. I'll tell you, if you make that one appear, yeah. I'll, I'll make this one disappear right in front of your very eyes. Now watch me very closely here. There we go. And... <laughs> uh, <laughs> there. Now, and... 
Uh, where's yours? Right here. All right. Be a... These things... <laughs> the heat... Here, hold this. <laughs> the heat is, uh, well... <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, Bill, we'll give you one that I really think you'll have difficulty in topping. Ladies and gentlemen, you are about to see a feat that has never been before accomplished or attempted here in the United States. Defying all danger, Mr. Lon Masterson will attempt to walk barefooted over a bed of flaming coals. The fire has just been ignited. I promise you it is real fire. He takes his shoes off. Clips are put around the cuffs of the trousers so that the trousers will not catch fire. Now, we'd like to have you be absolutely quiet while this is going on, please. Lon opens at the Club Macabre here in New York on June 29th, and as far as I'm concerned, he can have all that jazz he wants. <laughs> now I would like you to meet three more people who work behind the scenes on I've Got a Secret. First, another of our ushers, who is a comedian as well as a dancer, Peter Blake. Cameraman operates camera number one. He danced and acted in the Broadway musicals Boy from Syracuse and Keep Off the Grass. This is Lee Framer. heads up our research staff. He appears as an actor on Broadway and television, and in his hometown, hometown of Minneapolis, he used to be a dance instructor for Arthur Murray Studios. This is Rod Peterson. we present for the first time anywhere, Paisy and Company.
We oh, particularly, we particularly want to give our love and thanks to Faisy, who came down from Westport this afternoon, where she is currently appearing in witness for the prosecution. She came down here very early on this hot, hot day to rehearse with the fellows, and you will be up there in witness for the prosecution uh, through uh, June 29th. Is that right, Faye? Yes, Gary. Go see this hot cha-cha girl. <laughs> Our next guest, we're proud to say, is Joe Papp. And Joe Papp is the stage manager of I've Got a Secret and several other CBS programs. He is also the creator and producer of the Shakespearean Theater Workshop, which will be presenting free Shakespearean theater in New York City parks this summer. Now, the earphones that you see on Joe keep him in touch with the control room. But now we ask him to take off his earphones and join with another distinguished Shakespearean as we present... Seriously, a scene from Julius Caesar. Hand me that shirt. This scene features Mr. Joseph Papp and Mr. Henry Morgan. Imagine for a moment that you are citizens in ancient Rome. It's the 15th of March in the year 44 B.C. And you're in the marketplace. Julius Caesar has been stabbed to death by a group of men led by Brutus. Caesar's body lies before you right there in the marketplace, and the assassins have convinced you that Caesar was an evil dictator and that his murder was justified. You're glad that Caesar's dead. But now, Mark Anthony rises to speak. He calls you his friends, and all he asks of you that you lend him your ears. And slowly, as he speaks, you realize what you have lost in Caesar, and the tide of your feelings begins to turn. But yesterday, the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he there, and none so poor to do him reverence. Oh, masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong. You all know our honorable men. I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honorable men. If you have tears, Prepare to shed them now. You all do know this mantle. Look! In this place ran Cassius' dagger through. See what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this, the well-beloved Brutus stabbed. And as he plucked the cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed him as rushing out of doors to be resolved if Brutus so unkindly knocked or no. For Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, oh, you gods, how dearly Caesar loved him. This was the most unkindest cut of all. For when the noble Caesar saw him stab, in gratitude, more strong than traitor's arms, quite vanquished him, then burst his mighty heart. And in his mantle, muffling up his face, even at the base of Pompey's statua, which all the while ran blood, great Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen. Then I and you and all of us fell down whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Oh, now you weep. And I perceive you feel a dint of pity. These are gracious drops. Kind souls, what? Weep you when you but behold our Caesar's vesture wounded? Look you here. Here is himself, marred as you see with traitors. Good friends, sweet friends, let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. They that have done this deed are honorable. What private priests they have, alas, I know not that made them do it. They are wise and honorable and will no doubt with reasons answer you. I come not, friends, to steal away your hearts. I am no orator such as Brutus is, but as you know me all, a plain, blunt man that loved my friend. 
and that they knew full well that gave me public leave to speak of him. For I have neither wit, nor word, nor worth, action, nor utterance, nor the power of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right on. I tell you that which yourselves do know. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds. Poor, poor dumb mouths. And bid them speak for me. But what I, Brutus, and Brutus, Antony, there would an Antony that would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny! be a hard man to follow. We got a guy who can try it, though. On the top of this ladder, a good friend of ours by the name of Tommy Germain. And Tommy has been an electrician at CBS here for now for three years. Before that, he sang in opera and in the chorus of Guys and Dolls. So, Tom, this is your television debut. Tommy Germain. <laughs> Vero tanto sentimento A me posso vida cento Che me testo fa sognar Senti come li vesa lei Da già di nudo davanti Un glow fuma non veguale Te chi papita d'amore E tu dici da patto a Dio Da lontani da mi cuore Thanks to you, Tommy. We will be back in just a moment. Travel arrangements for I've Got a Secret are made through United Airlines. United Airlines flies our contestants in fast new DC-7 mainliners. Very, very happy fifth birthday for us. We hope a pleasant half hour at least for you. And so until tomorrow morning on our morning show or until next Wednesday night, then this is Gary Moore saying be very kind to each other, will you? We have a small song to close with. Norman goes like this, I do believe. <laughs> Every Wednesday in the evening, ain't we got fun? When the panel's on the channel, ain't we got fun? You look so handsome on CBS, dear. <laughs> if NBC calls, don't tell them I'm here. <laughs> We're so friendly, true and trusting, ain't, ain't we, we got, got fun? Oh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>